Muito bom dia a todos os participantes, sejam todos bem-vindos. É, com grande satisfação que damos início ao nosso segundo dia de atividade do nosso primeiro Congresso Nacional em Física e Química e Engenharia de Materiais da Universidade Federal de São João del Rei. Agora eu gostaria de dar alguns recados é, para durante a palestra. Nós gostaríamos de lembrar aos participantes que as dúvidas que, que tiver no decorrer durante a, a palestra deverão ser enviadas via chat e depois todas serão respondidas ao final da apresentação. Fique bem atentos, porque durante a atividade será destacada na tela uma palavra-chave. Essa palavra-chave, ela deve ser usada na resposta do formulário de presença, que será enviado também no final da palestra. Então, fique atento, pois essa, essa palavra-chave, ela aparecerá em momentos aleatórios. Agora, eu gostaria de chamar o nosso doutorando Brenner, o professor doutor Marcos Quiavon e o nosso palestrante, o professor doutor Jacques Monse. Com você, com o nosso doutorando Brenner, a palavra. Ok. Ok, thank you. So, good afternoon, Jacques. And good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, who is going to talk to us about exton and carrier dynamics in lead halide perovskites. This is a subject in which we should all be deeply interested because it reveals how the charge carriers recombine in semiconductor after photoxidation. This process occurs in a ultra fast time scale from femtosecond to nanoseconds. And with this kind of information, we can improve, for instance, the efficiency of solar cells and light emitting device. So first, it's a pleasure for me to have you here, Professor Moser. Thank you for accepting our invitation to attend and participate in our conference today. I'm pretty sure that your talk, you contribute a lot to the researchers and the students here. So I'm going to cite some highlights about Professor Moser's resume. Uh, Jacques Edward Moser is a full professor in physical chemistry at the Institute of Chemical Science and engineer at Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, EPFL. He's currently director of the Photochemical Dynamics Research Group, or as it is known, MOSE Group at the PFL. He graduated from the Ecole Polytechnique Federal de Lausanne, where he received a diploma degree in chemical engineer in 1982. After two years in 1984 and 1985 at Concordia University in Montreal, Canada, He earned, in 1986, his PhD in physical chemistry at EPFL under the supervision of Professor Michael Gretz. In 1986, he joined the Estiman Kodak Corporation Research Laboratories at Rochester, United States of America, as a postdoctoral fellow and was later associated with the NSF Center for Photoinduced Electron Transfer at the University of Rochester. Returning to Switzerland, he was appointed as a lecturer of physical chemistry at EPFL in 1992 and was awarded the habilitation in 1998. He's a full professor since 2005. His research activity focuses on the study of the dynamics of hot induced electron transfer and charge carrier separation at donor acceptor at junctions in photovoltaic system. He's the author and co-author of more than 200 scientific papers, H index of 74. He currently teaches uh, general physical chemistry to undergraduate students in chemistry. He gives 
two classes on the general and redox photochemistry in the master program in molecular and biological chemistry and the doctoral programs in chemistry, energy, and photonics. Jacques presided the Swiss Society of Photochemistry and Photophysics. He was a member of the board of the Swiss Chemical Society and he served as a member of the Standing Committee of the Euro European Photochemistry Association and of the Executive Committee of the Division for Fundamental Research of the Swiss Chemical Society. He was the director of the section of chemistry and chemical engineer of EPFL and a member of the direction of the School of Basic Science from 2007 to 2015. Um, so, uh, Marco, would like to add anything else? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, good afternoon for you, Professor Moser. Uh, I just would like to thank you so much for attend this invitation. So it's very important for us to have uh, your conference here. We are so happy to, to have you between us. Okay. So I think you, uh, you are welcome. Thank you very much. Good, good morning to everyone. Um, uh, thank you, Professor Schiavon. Uh, thank you, Brenner, for your kind introduction. Uh, many thanks also to uh, all the organizers uh, for your invitation to deliver a lecture in the frame of this uh, quite impressive conference. I would have preferred, of course, uh, to be in Brazil today with you okay. <laughs> rather than streaming online uh, from my office in Lausanne. Uh, <laughs> let's hope that the pandemic uh, that hits Brazil and the rest of the world so hard um, will fade away uh, and allow us to resume uh, personal meetings uh, soon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's so dangerous to, to be here now, Professor. <laughs> <laughs> that, well, Switzerland is not much better, so. Yeah. Okay. 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 I think so, professor, from, and you, uh, you, you are going to start to make a presentation. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So let's switch to to my presentation. In that case, thanks again. Okay. okay. We'll be here uh, if you need something. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So, okay. so good morning again to everyone. So. Uh, my ambition today is to share with you some of our findings regarding the properties of lead halide perovskite materials that uh, Brenner has introduced uh, to you uh, very shortly uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, these solution processable semiconductors have been at the origin nine years ago of a real revolution in the field of photovoltaics. And uh, here I would like more specifically to discuss the role of uh, charge transfer excitons in the light induced process of charge carrier separation. Charge transfer states or charge transfer excitons are defined as electrostatically bound uh, electron hole pairs that uh, sit astride um, uh, uh, an interface or a domain boundary. Uh, after one of the carrier has uh, been transferred across the interface. Each type of carrier experience a, a different environment. Uh, one is uh, on uh, one domain, the other one is another, another domain. And uh, the charge transfer exciton is uh, usually characterized by a, a permanent dipole. And this is uh, uh, the, uh, the source of an electric field that is represented here by these uh, field lines. And this electric field, of course, affects all the environment of these uh, charge transfer ex excitons. And uh, I would like to, to show that uh, actually this electric field can be uh, visualized 
allowing to scrutinize the spatial temporal dynamics of these excitons and of uh, the free carriers in complex materials of uh, here mixed composition and mixed dimensionality. So uh, the menu I propose uh, for my talk uh, uh, this morning is then the following. Um, after an introduction to lead trilite perovskites, uh, 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 we will see how uh, mixed cation, mixed halide perovskite thin films can uh, actually benefit from an improved photovoltaic performance. So here we are. Uh, we are going to discuss more, uh, particularly uh, mixed halide perovskites. Then uh, we will uh, get interested in colloidal dispersion of uh, perovskite nanocrystal aggregates that experience a strong quantum confinement and see how charge transfer can occur between particles of different dimensionality uh, in competition with the energy transfer. And then finally, um, um, uh, we will focus on the last evolution of perovskite solar cells that uh, encompass a bulk 3D perovskite material coated by a 2D layer. And uh, we will try to unravel the mechanism of electron transfer in such systems. So let's start with uh, our first point. So a small introduction to lead trialite perovskite just for those people who are not very familiar with the field. So the word perovskite uh, sounds strange. Uh, I have a problem here it is, okay. The, the word perovskite actually stands for a crystalline structure. This crystalline structure is common to all the compounds with the uh, uh, formula ABX3 where, where AB uh, are cations and X is an anion. One uh, typical perovskite that you could have heard about is uh, the strontium titanate, where strontium two plus is uh, A, uh, titanium four plus is B, and uh, uh, X is oxygen two minus. So in that case, of course, the whole thing is neutral. And uh, this is a typical example of a perovskite, an oxide perovskite in that case. Now we are talking about uh, uh, lead halide perovskite. Whoops, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I have a problem with my arrow, so I have uh, difficulty to, to uh, observe it. Here it is again. So here the A will be, <laughs> again, terrible. So here the A cation will be, uh, uh, for example, uh, here the uh, methyl ammonium uh, uh, cation. B will be lead, two plus. And uh, finally, the anion here will be I minus, so iodide or bromide or other type of halides. And we see that the structure is quite particular. We have a octahedra here with all the corners here uh, represented by iodide ions. In the middle of each octahedra, you have a lead two plus ion. And then you have an arrangement of this octahedra in a cubic structure, which leaves here in the middle a vacancy, which is large enough to accommodate, for example, this organic uh, methyl ammonium ion. You can have other ions here in the middle, for example, you can replace this uh, methyl ammonium with cesium uh, plus, for example, you can, uh, uh, two plus, you can uh, accommodate other larger uh, cations too. We will see a little bit later uh, that we can indeed have a rather large uh, uh, cations here uh, that could sit in the middle. So. The production of such a complex structure is actually extremely simple. So the synthesis of such uh, a pair of guys is uh, amazingly simple. You just use uh, lead iodide, which is a yellowish uh, uh, colored semiconductor. So it's only pale yellow. You can make a film of this uh, lead iodide by just uh, 
spin coating, for example, on any substrate. And then you apply on this uh, lead iodide a drop of a, solu of a solution of uh, methyl ammonium iodide, which is colorless. And uh, then you will observe an immediate reaction, which uh, will uh, make the film turn black. And uh, uh, this uh, will be now the result of uh, uh, the production of this methyl ammonium lead triiodide. Here on the right, you have a, a crystalline structure view of this uh, uh, compound. We see that uh, this compound has very large channels where now these uh, organic uh, here uh, ions are, are, are piling up. And uh, of course, this is quite open and uh, this is also a weakness of this material. So that means these uh, cations which are sitting in these channels can easily be replaced by water, for example, or ammonia or anything. So I don't know why it is jumping all the time. So I'm sorry about that. I apologize for these jumps, but uh, I'm not sure I am uh, responsible for that. So. So, uh, so this is, of course, a weakness. So this uh, methyl ammonium lead triiodide is not very stable and it uh, fears the humidity in particular uh, because water can easily intercalate into this. And uh, of course, the structure would change and the color will be completely different. And the black color will turn actually orange or yellow. So, Everything started actually with the two papers which appeared in 2012. So one in science uh, reports by the group of uh, Gretzel here in Lausanne with uh, some Korean uh, collaborators and uh, one paper by the group of uh, Henry Snace uh, at Oxford. And uh, these two papers actually report this compound, lead uh, methyl ammonium iodide, has a new photovoltaic compound and uh, uh, underlined the uh, potential of this material for, for such uh, an application. And since, since 2012, it's amazing to know that about 10,000 papers were published on, uh, on the subject, on perovskite materials and on the photovoltaics based on these materials, 10,000. So what is uh, special about uh, this compound? So first of all, here you can see uh, an absorption spectrum of this prototype uh, uh, compound, methyl ammonium lead triodide, which is uh, usually uh, viewed as a hybrid organic inorganic uh, compound. And we see first of all that uh, there is an excitonic band so for sure, so that means we will have to take care of this ex excitonic band. But after that, we have a direct band gap absorption. Direct band gap means that the absorption is extremely strong compared to silicon, for example, and uh, only 200 nanometers film, for example, so a very thin film will be sufficient to absorb 100% uh, of the incident solar light, for example. And uh, of course, we have to take care of this excitonic band. But in the case of the iodide, for example, the exciton binding energy is extremely small, only about 20 milli electron volts. So that means uh, at the same order of magnitude than KT, so the thermal energy. Sorry again. And uh, it means that this uh, exciton will dissociate extremely fast in less than one picosecond, 500 femtosecond we have measured. And uh, uh, that means uh, immediately after irradiation or absorption of the photon, we'll get free carriers, electron and holes in the system. So basically this lead iodide is not an excitonic uh, compound, at least when it is in the bulk uh, situation. Of course, if we have uh, quantum confinement and uh, other uh, uh, halide like bromide and so on, things could be different. But in the bulk of this iodide compound, we have no excitonic uh, behavior. We have indeed uh, a semiconductor which will photogenerate uh, free electron and holes upon irradiation. 
So what is uh, special about uh, this semiconductor is actually the very long uh, time constant for carrier recombination. The carrier recombination it's, uh, in such a compound is uh, extremely uh, slow. And uh, it uh, takes about, uh, here we have, for example, a fluorescence, a time result fluorescence uh, measurement uh, with uh, TCSPC. And we see that actually the decay of the fluorescence of uh, genuine uh, methyl ammonium lead uh, uh, triiodide uh, is typically 0.3 microseconds so 300 nanoseconds. So this is extremely slow compared to other semiconductors of the same type, like gallium arsenide or silicon, so not the same type, but the, uh, semiconductors which would compete also for photovoltaic application. And what is remarkable is that this uh, very slow uh, carrier recombination translates into a very long uh, diffusion length for carriers, which is uh, more than one micron. So this is... Uh, uh, fantastic, because uh, remember that we would need only about 100 to 200 nanometer uh, thick uh, films in order to harvest 100% of the incident light, which means that if you have now uh, carrier diffusion lengths uh, exceeding one micron, you have no problem to have your carriers diffuse from one side of uh, your film to the other side without having any possibility to, to uh, recombine. So this is, of course, one of the main uh, characteristics, which is extremely positive for this uh, material. The other, of course, characteristic, which is extremely interesting for us, is that uh, it is solution processable, so that you don't need to evaporate it. You, you don't need very expensive way to, um, to deposit uh, this semiconductor. Uh, as I told you, the way uh, the semiconductor is synthesized is extremely simple. So it means that it is accessible to chemists and even uh, to chemical engineers. And uh, so far, two different architectures, or even more than that, but two efficient architectures were reported. First one is, um, of course, uh, uh, deriving from the architecture of a dye-sensitized uh, system where you have a mesoscopic TiO2 structure. So that means a structure made of uh, nanoparticles, typically 20 nanometers in diameter of TiO2. And uh, the uh, uh, perovskite is used as a conformal film on top of these particles. So you it is more or less the same type of structure as dye-sensitized solar cells, where the perovskite replaces the, um, the, the dye. Okay, in that case, of course, the TiO2 will serve as an electron acceptor material. Electrons, which are photogenerated in the perovskite, will be injected into the TiO2 and then brought, of course, to uh, now uh, back contact, while the holes will be collected now by a whole transmitting materials, typically an organic uh, material like a spiral TAD. So that means a, a bifluorine type of material. And uh, then the holes will be uh, driven now to uh, a gold contact on the back. We will see the structure a little bit later. So another type of architecture is uh, simply a trilayer layer plan planner heterojunction. You don't need actually a bulk heterojunction like uh, described here on the left because of this very long diffusion length of uh, the carriers. So in that case, you can have here a layer of uh, about 200 nanometer of your perovskite, simply a layer of, uh, of uh, electron acceptor like uh, tin oxide, simply tin oxide, and here uh, uh, simply here some... Uh, conductive glass. On the other side, you can have again the HTM, so the whole transporting material, this organic uh, transporting material, and, and then the back contact, which will usually be uh, uh, gold. So 
This is now a picture which shows the band alignment uh, for, for a typical system, a trilayer system. So here you have the electron transporting material, so TiO2 typically. Here you have the uh, perovskites. So of course the, uh, the idea would be to have uh, the conduction band of the perovskite higher in energy than the bottom of the conduction band of uh, the TiO2 so that electrons can be easily injected here into uh, the empty uh, levels uh, in the conduction band of the uh, titanium dioxide. On the other side, the holes will be uh, tr transmitted to here uh, the hole transporting material. And the idea is, of course, that uh, here the uh, top edge of the valence band of this uh, transporting material has to be higher than the top edge of uh, the uh, valence band of the, the perovskite so that uh, electrons can be trans transported from the HTM to the valence band of the perovskite or if you wish holes can be injected into this material. And then you have of course uh, the, the back contact which is usually gold. So gold uh, uh, it has been chosen so that, of course, typically you have uh, the right band alignment. And if you now compare the level of the uh, Fermi level in the TiO2 and the Fermi level in the gold, here the difference will uh, define the, the VOC, so the open circuit voltage of the, the system. And uh, remarkable for such a system is that the VOC is larger than 1.2 volts. So remember that for silicon, typically you have a voltage of 0.5 volts. So this is absolutely remarkable. It means that if you build a panel, for example, with uh, uh, small cells in series, you will need actually uh, twice less uh, elements in order to get the same voltage at the end. Now, uh, all the, uh, the rates for this electron transfer processes have been measured, and this has been done quite early in our lab in 2014. This has been measured mostly by ultra-fast uh, transient absorption spectroscopy because uh, some of the processes are extremely fast. Here you see that the charge injection can be as fast as 100 femtosecond. Here, the same for the whole injection and the recombinations are, are extremely slow in comparison. For example, here the electron can be injected in TiO2 within 100 femtoseconds, while it comes back only in 10 microseconds. So that means orders and orders of magnitude uh, slower. So in terms of uh, photovoltaic performance, you might know for people who are working in uh, photovoltaics, uh, the, this famous chart, which is uh, uh, published by the NREL, so the National Renewable Energy Lab in the United States in Boulder, Colorado. This is uh, a chart which uh, compiles all the best research cell efficiencies, so for different technologies. And of course, this is made uh, uh, now with the, with the different years. And uh, here you have uh, all the best systems. So maybe let's zoom in a little bit. And here we have, uh, for example, this region where the yellow uh, points are actually uh, relating to a perovskite system. So this lead halide perovskite. So everything started at EPFL in 2012. We have seen that with the, with the uh, power conversion efficiency, which was of the order of 14%. And then it went up quite steeply. You see that within one or two years, we went up to almost 22 percent, uh, and uh, now, uh, well, the the, uh, the best results are, are obtained by Korean people and uh, and other uh, people uh, with uh, efficiencies which are close to 25 or 26 uh, percent. And this is uh, now to be compared with the uh, silicon, the best silicon solar cells. We see that the best silicon solar cells, which are represented by these uh, blue squares here, are pretty much at the same level in terms of power conversion efficiencies, around 26-27%. Remarkable also on this uh, uh, chart is uh, now these triangles here. 
Those triangles are actually um, uh, tandem cells, which are constituted of silicon. So here it is, of perovskites and silicon tandem. So that means uh, you have a monolithic system where the uh, the perovskites is actually in tandem with the uh, silicon, which absorbs a bit better in the infrared. And uh, these systems are extremely uh, good. So they reach right now uh, 29, so very close to 30%. Remember that to, uh, well, these numbers might be uh, a bit confusing. You would say, okay, the, the, the power conversion efficiency is only 26% for uh, uh, mono junction system like uh, the ones uh, which are represented by the yellow circle. But uh, you have to remember that the chocolate Kaiser limit, which is now the limit which is imposed by the thermodynamics, is at 31%. So if you reach now uh, power conversion efficiency of 26%, you are not very far from the optimum, the thermodynamic optimum. And uh, of course, for uh, multi-junction system. Here we can uh, compare quite well with the systems here, which are multi-junction silicon solar cells. So, so actually these systems here with tandem silicon perovskites are quite interesting and are seen as one of the solutions actually that uh, could uh, compete with uh, the actual very expensive silicon multi-junction cells. Okay, so I hope that uh, with this uh, very short introduction, you have uh, now uh, uh, have some some taste for those uh, uh, photovoltaic materials. And uh, now we would like to to uh, enter a little bit uh, more in details into uh, the mechanism for electron uh, uh, hole charge separation in such systems. So the first system we are going to to um, discuss is actually a mixed uh, uh, composition system. So uh, quite uh, early, people have noticed that uh, you have uh, an improvement of the performances when you actually replace the methyl ammonium by a larger uh, cation, which is here, this formamidium, formamidinium uh, cation. So this is a bit larger and it changes uh, the structures very slightly. And in that case, we people have noticed that uh, indeed the diffusion length for carriers is even longer than in methyl ammonium systems. So this was published in uh, 2016 and 2000, 2017. Unfortunately, these uh, formamidinium led the iodide perovskites were, were indeed more efficient, but they were also quite unstable. So for a few years, actually, people uh, actually abandoned the idea of using this form of medium just because of this stability problem. And only recently in 2019, it was demonstrated that actually, if you use other type of uh, anions like uh, bromide rather than the iodide, and you introduce a little bit of bromide into the, uh, the iodide system, you replace part of the formamidium by cesium and part of it also by rubidium. So you see that you have a very complex structure which will contain methyl ammonium, formamidinium, cesium, rubidium, and uh, iodide and bromide, and of course some lead, which uh, is not changed. So such very complex mixed composition system were shown actually to, to be quite stable and uh, show the best performances. And right now, uh, the best systems are actually based on this mixed composition system. So this is a bit strange because of course, if you change exchange the iodide against bromide, what you have is a change of the band gap of the system. The band gap becomes uh, wider. It means that, of course, the absorption threshold, which is normally here above 800 nanometers in the near infrared for the methyl ammonium lead triiodide, will move to the visible down to 550 or 500. So you have something which is black at the beginning. And if you uh, now change the iodide against bromide, you will go to something yellowish or orange. 
And of course, it is hard to understand why and how now by introducing bromide, so that means by decreasing uh, the uh, part of the solar spectrum which is covered by the absorption of uh, the material, you can increase the uh, here photovoltaic performance. And this is uh, part of our motivation to understand here the mechanism of uh, charge separation in such a complex system. So here on the right, you have uh, the absorption spectrum. So this is now the spectrum of uh, the uh, pristine methyl ammonium lead triiodide. And here you have the absorption spectrum of this mixed composition system. So you see that you noticed on the absorption spectrum some uh, small peaks or waves or shoulders. And these shoulders actually are indicative of, uh, of uh, excitons which are uh, here for different compositions. So when you increase the uh, amount of bromide, of course, now those excitonic bands will shift to the blue here. And you see that some here appear at uh, 450 nanometers. So uh, quite uh, far uh, in, the, in the blue. So here you have, uh, of course, not just one composition which is mixed, but you have a heterogeneous uh, structure with some domains which contains more or less uh, uh, iodide and more or less bromide. <sighs> okay, so now if we uh, uh, just um, make a very simple fluorescent subconversion uh, experiment, so this is uh, now time resolved fluorescence, what we see if uh, we excite at 400 nanometers, so typically in domains which are bromide rich, we see that uh, the fluorescence of these bromide rich uh, domains will decay quite fast and, uh, we, and the energy will be transferred to now iodide rich uh, domains. So actually what we see at long time scale is the fluorescence of the iodide rich. And this is quite, uh, normal because we expect, of course, the energy which is now uh, acquired by uh, Im illumination of domains which are bromide rich to be transferred to uh, now uh, other domains which have, of course, uh, uh, a, a smaller band gap. And this is typically what we observe, provided that we pump the energy quite hard, so with 200 nanojoule per pulse here. Now, if we decrease the pump energy, something strange is observed. We observe that actually the bromide rich domains do not fluoresce anymore. So here, the fluorescence, which was here uh, observed at the one picosecond time scale is absent here uh, in the blue. And uh, all uh, the fluorescence comes actually from iodide rich domains. So it means that there is a fast non-radiative process that is favored at low pump fluence because here we used a, a pump energy which is about uh, four times lower than before. And uh, this uh, non-radiative process actually uh, now makes all the fluorescence of the bromide disappear. So now the question is what is this process and what makes now the uh, bromide uh, be quenched completely? So the answer comes from uh, transient absorption spectroscopy. So here we use uh, femtosecond laser experiments using a pump probe uh, type of uh, scheme. So we send uh, a pump uh, pulse, so typically at 400 nanometers, for example, in the blue. And uh, uh, then the, this pump uh, pulse will generate uh, carriers in the, the material something will happen, so some dynamics will occur. And after a delayed time, which is well controlled, we send a second pulse, usually a white light pulse, rather than a monochromatic pulse. And this white light pulse allows to measure the absorption spectrum of the material at uh, the given time. So here, for example, you see typically the transient absorption spectra, which are obtained at different time after the illumination by the pump pulse. This is for the standard methyl ammonium lead triiodide. 
and we see that uh, indeed we have a huge bleaching here of uh, at the wavelength which correspond to the, the excitonic band and here we have something which is uh, pretty much uh, unstructured in the same conditions if we use now this mixed uh, composition perovskite films uh, the transient absorption spectra are quite different here we we see that at very short time scale of course we have nothing here then we have something which is extremely structured here in the uh, in the visible and here we see again the uh, uh, some bleaching and this bleaching correspond pretty much to uh, now uh, the fluorescence or actually the absorption of uh, of uh, bromide rich or rather bromide rich uh, domains in the system at longer time scale we see that uh, actually this uh, bleaching shifts to the red and we see that actually we uh, see now some more iodide-rich domains being bleached in the system. But still, we keep now this very strange structure here in the visible, which uh, seems to be an artifact. Uh, in the first view we had uh, from the system, we thought, wow, this is terrible. This must be an artifact. Actually, it's not. This is typical of a, uh, an electroabsorption uh, signal what is electroabsorption so electroabsorption is actually what we call also the stark effect so that means this is a shift of the absorption band due to an electric field so here for example if uh, we have an absorption band which is here this black curve here and uh, if uh, now this absorption band is shifted due to some electric field applied on the system and if it is shifted to the red here in this case, then we will measure a different spectrum. So a differential spectrum, which is now due to this uh, uh, electric field, which will be this uh, red uh, differential spectrum. And this, you see that this is typically what we observe in the uh, transient absorption spectrum, where we have something which looks like a differential rather than uh, a normal smooth absorption spectrum. So where is this uh, electric field coming from? So this is now the big question. So of course, in the system, upon uh, irradiation, you will form first excitons in the material. These are bulk excitons, usually called vanier mot or vanier type of excitons. These are excitons which are also formed by now the binding of uh, electron hole pairs. We have seen that uh, this uh, uh, energy for the, the binding of these pairs is pretty weak of the order of KT. So this exciton will tend to, to dissociate quite fast. These excitons, of course, uh, uh, have uh, uh, an electron, which uh, we, you can see that uh, uh, also with an image which is derived from the Bohr model of the hydrogen atom. So you can see this exciton as a, an, a, an electron gravitating here around the hole. And of course, in that case, you understand that such excitons do not have a permanent dipole. So here the permanent dipole of such exciton is zero. This is quite different from uh, uh, for excitons which are form a stride here, an interface or a domain boundary. Here, if you have uh, holes in, on one side, electrons on the other side of this boundary, of course, here now you have a permanent dipole, which is quite uh, evident because now you have now the system which is quite oriented. And this uh, charge transfer exciton will produce now an electric field due to this dipole, which will affect, of course, the surrounding material here around. And this will be actually the source of the, ex the electric field, which will produce now the shift of the absorption band in the material. So usually uh, uh, the uh, this, uh, uh, well, I think it is easier maybe to, to jump directly to the model, although it might be a little bit heavy for, for general views. But here, this is the Stark uh, model. So this is now the absorption spectrum uh, upon 
application of an electric field. So this is called electroabsorption. Okay, so electroabsorption. Here we are talking about a photo-induced electroabsorption because this is not an electric field that we apply from the outside of the system, but rather this is now uh, an, uh, an electric field which is uh, now produced by the exciton we have in the system. And uh, this is now the stock model. So the ele electroabsorption uh, spectrum is the spectrum in the presence of an electric field minus the spectrum in the absence of an electric field. And we see that it is a combination of the first derivative of uh, uh, now the uh, electric field and the second derivative of the electric field. So here we have the first derivative, and here we have the change of uh, the uh, of, uh, uh, dipole moment of the system. If you have an isotropic material with dipole moments oriented in all direction, uh, this will be equal to zero. So this first term actually will be nil. And then we will have now to take into account the, uh, the change in the polarizability of the material. This is alpha which will be uh, present in this term here, where the field is squared. And here you have a second term where the field is also squared, which will depend on the dipole moment. But in that case, since this dipole moment is squared, this will be non-zero. And here we see that it will depend on the uh, second derivative of the absorption spectrum. So you, you see that actually by fitting the absorption spectrum or the electroabsorption spectrum, we'll be actually able to, to see which term actually is dominant. And we will be able to see if the polarizability is affected or the dipole moment. And this is exactly what we did. So we started from the strange structured uh, absorption spectrum that we noticed uh, from our uh, measurements on these mixed uh, composition uh, systems. And uh, we uh, noticed that uh, by fitting now this with the first derivative of the absorption spectrum and the second derivative of the absorption spectrum, the second derivative definitely is much better in terms of fitting. So we see that this gray here fits quite well with the shape, at least the shape of this uh, absorption spectrum. Our conclusion is that uh, uh, the second derivative uh, is important. So this is this term here. And we see that this second derivative is associated with a change in the dipole moment. So remember that uh, actually the bulk uh, excitons do not have a permanent dipole. So it means that uh, this signal now must come from uh, the uh, charge transfer excitons, so excitons which have a dipole moment, a permanent dipole moment. So this is actually the evidence that the charge transfer excitons are involved in the systems. So remember that these are now electron hole pairs which are bound together electrostatically, but where the two types of carriers now sit on two different uh, uh, sides of uh, uh, domain boundary. I'm sorry about those jumps. This becomes a little bit tiring. Okay, so now, uh, since we have this absorption spectrum, we can look at the time now we have uh, to, to jump from one domain to the next and to the next. And here we see that typically we can uh, have uh, electron transfer, which is mediated by these charge transfer excitons, which uh, uh, from uh, bromide-rich to uh, iodide-rich now domains, which takes place within 11 picoseconds for the first jump. And then the second jump will take 100, nanosec 100 picoseconds sorry, for, for moving to uh, iodide-rich system. So now we can have a, a picture of uh, what's happening. So this is more or less how we can schematize the, the, the problem. So here we have uh, iodide, oh, sorry, bromide rich uh, domain. So with a large band gap here, you see that uh, it is more yellowish. And then when we move to the right, we have now domains with increasing iodide composition, iodide content, where the band gap is of course now smaller. 
And uh, now the first uh, process is, of course, that uh, a hole typically has to be transferred from uh, the, here, this uh, bromide rich to the next domain, which have, contains less bromide. In that case, you have some driving force because the valence band now is higher in energy. So the holes will be transferred here, here with some uh, driving force. By doing that, of course, the holes will now sit on the other side of the interface between the two domains. And uh, you will be able to form here an electron hole uh, charge transfer exciton or charge transfer state. Uh, the difference between the word charge transfer state and charge transfer exciton, we use usually the word exciton when these uh, systems are mobile, so can be transported. So here we tend to use more uh, often the, the word charge transfer exciton. So then when, uh, my God. so when you have such a system, of course the holes can uh, again now be transferred to another uh, domain, which uh, has the more iodide. And uh, of course, an electron can also do that, although there is no driving force here. The, the conduction band will be the same everywhere. Uh, the conduction band in these lead allied uh, perovskites is constituted by um, orbitals which are sitting on the lead. So that means this is, of course, common to all the, the domains, while here the valence band here changes due to the change in the halide. And of course, now you see that these charge transfer excitons now are able to move to the right to now uh, iodide rich uh, systems. So now if we look at uh, a system, uh, a film where you have domains which contains bromide rich uh, perovskite and domains which uh, contain iodide rich perovskite, we see that actually the holes will tend of course to percolate from the bromide rich to the iodide rich system. And this is, of course, at the origin of a vectorial transport for holes. And uh, uh, here, uh, finally, if you have a hole transporting materials, the holes will be trapped in this system and conveyed to the vector uh, contact. This can be made even better. Recently, uh, uh, people were uh, able to show that uh, if you treat the surface of uh, this perovskite system, so the mixed composition perovskite system, you will actually enrich one side with iodide, where the rest will be now, uh, will have less iodide. So the result is actually a gradient of composition, a gradient of composition across the whole film. And on one side, you have something which is more bromide rich. And uh, here you will ideally put uh, the uh, electron acceptor material, while on the other side, where now the perovskite is uh, uh, now characterized by more iodide, so you have iodide-rich material, here in this case, you will be able to contact with the uh, uh, now whole transporting material. Okay, as you can see, my uh, presentation would like to go to something else. So let's go now quickly to, to may, maybe a, another example of the uh, occurrence of uh, charge transfer exciton is uh, now uh, uh, the case of aggregates of uh, uh, 2D and 3D nanoplatelets and nanoparticles. So we will move now to a colloidal system uh, where you, we have nano crystals dispersed in these systems. And uh, if we make, uh, we, we start with methyl ammonium lead tri uh, tribromide, uh, because it will be easier to, to, to study. And these systems, if you uh, just produce this uh, very costly without uh, so much care, you will get actually type of aggregates where you have 3D nanoparticles, but you have also nanoplatelets with different thicknesses. So that means where you have different uh, intensities of the quantum confinement for carriers in these materials. So of course, if the thickness is very small, you have a stronger confinement and you will find your excitonic bands shifted to the blue quite a lot, 
while if the thickness becomes a little bit larger, then you find now exit tonic bind, which shift to the red. And finally, for 3D nanoparticles, uh, where the quantum confinement is minimal, of course, you will have now the excitonic band, which is uh, at the nominal uh, position at around three, uh, 530 nanometers for the bromide. Okay, so now this is the absorption spectrum of uh, our colloidal dispersion. We see now that we have different types of particles that we can really identify from here the position of the excitonic band. So what will happen if now we do also a transient absorption spectrum? So if we excite at 480 nanometers, so that means with uh, now uh, the absorption band of uh, some of the nanoparticles, we see here the starting point of some differential uh, shape here, but this is much more evident if we excite at 390 nanometers. So in uh, now the, the smaller, the, the band gap of the smaller uh, nanoplatelets, so the very thin nanoplatelets, we see again here this famous and typical structure which is due to this differential absorption, electroabsorption spectrum. So here again, the game is to fit this absorption spectrum using the Stark model. And what we see again is that this uh, spectrum shows a little bit of uh, uh, contribution of the first derivative, but a large contribution of the second derivative. So again, we can show that uh, this is now due to a change of uh, the permanent dipole, which is uh, now uh, induced by the electric field generated by these uh, charge transfer excitons. So here, this is again the evidence of uh, the role played by the charge transfer excitons. So what happens? Uh, of course, uh, here it is quite simple. You have here different particles stacked stacking ideally. So this is of course a scheme, okay? Uh, and here you have the smaller nanoplatelets, the one which have the, 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 the less thickness and here the large band gap. And if, if you excite now uh, across this band gap for the smaller nanoplatelets, you will get electron hole pairs. Now, uh, for instance, you could have electron transfer from one uh, nanoplatelets to the next one, to, to uh, the one which is slightly larger. Here you have some driving force for that. And if you do that, of course, you will constitute a uh, charge transfer exciton at the boundary between the two domains. So here in between. Then, of course, the holes can follow and you will restore here a bulk exciton in the uh, nanoplatelets with M equal to four. So M here is just the thickness of these nanoplatelets. And you can have, for example, energy transfer to uh, another platelet, which has now a smaller band gap. And uh, if you do that, of course, you can have electron holes here. And the hole can be again transferred to, to the next uh, domain. And you will form again a charge transfer exciton. So we see that actually we have competing with the energy transfer, we have now uh, uh, a process of electron transfer or charge transfer. So we can call this a, a charge transfer exciton mediated interdomain hole transfer or charge transfer in general. So this is quite interesting because we see that this charge transfer exciton play an evident role when we have now, uh, now systems we, where the, we, we have di different dimensionalities. So uh, the, uh, the last point I would like to show is uh, now this uh, system, we, we're, which is now one of the best photovoltaic systems where we have a 2D uh, perovskite layer covering a normal 3D uh, system. So here is a picture. So here you have typically the 3D perovskite system that we have seen in the, my first slide, where here these are the octahedra, uh, where the iodides, for example, are sitting at the corners. The lead is in the middle, of course, 
and uh, you have now typically the structure of the 3D perovskite that we have discussed so far. As I mentioned in the beginning, this is uh, quite e efficient, but unfortunately not very stable. So that means this is uh, not stable in the presence of humidity, of water, and will be destroyed quite easily. And of course, this is not good if you would like to use it uh, for real application outdoors, uh, because uh, if your system now tends to be destroyed as soon you have a little bit of water traces present, it will be a catastrophe and will end up in lead 2 plus leaking in, your, in the ground, which is, of course, uh, quite of a pollutant. So the idea is to to uh, cover now this uh, 3D perovskite by a layer which is actually insulating, which contains organic uh, now uh, uh, here cations, and these organic cations will be hydrophobic. So the idea will be to coat now the 3D uh, perovskite with a, a layer or multi-layer. Here we have two uh, layers of perovskites, and here we have now this organic moiety, which is now separating, insulating the 2D uh, part from the 3D part. And uh, these organic uh, are quite simple to, to uh, imagine. Simply, you will introduce as a, a cation, an organic cation, now large uh, cation, so where the size is so large that actually it will not uh, be possible for the perovskite to, to accommodate the 3D structure. So here you have one layer of those octahedra, then you have now these large organic uh, cations, and then you have another layer of the octahedra, and so on. And you see that there is no way that actually you get a 3D structure as before. So this is called now uh, a 2D uh, perovskite uh, structure. This 2D structure it has a very low efficiency compared to the 3D because, of course, you don't have uh, now the same kind of uh, uh, diffusion lengths for the carriers. Here you have a strong confinement of uh, electron and holes be due to, uh, of course, uh, the, the quantum confinement and the fact that, of course, the surrounding of this layer is organic, so you don't have the same dielectric around. And so this confinement now leads to a very strong excitonic uh, behavior. So excitons now will be much more difficult to dissociate. And because of that, you won't be able easily to get free electron and holes moving in such system. But the idea would be actually to have a mixed dimensional perovskite where the 3D system is coated with a layer of this uh, high stability 2D. As I uh, mentioned here, these 2D systems are very stable because the organic moiety here is hydrophobic. So here are the, some examples of these large cations, organic cations, that actually produce uh, uh, these uh, 2D type of structures. Here you have, for example, butyl ammonium, uh, benzyl ammonium, phenylethyl ammonium, you see, and even larger here, this fluorinated type of uh, here uh, cation. Here the distance is quite long, and this is, of course, quite hydrophobic and uh, will indeed protect uh, our perovskite quite well against uh, water in particular. So depending on uh, now the uh, 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 cation used, the structure will be slightly different. For example, you see that if you use such uh, uh, phenylethyl ammonium system, you have nicely uh, aligned here 2D uh, layers which are coated on the surface of the, the 3D perovskite. If you use another type of, of uh, cation here, you might have something which is more disordered, where you still have some domains with 2D, but rather than having here the 2D layers aligned with the surface of the 3D, here you have now something which is more complex and more difficult, of course, to model. So now what uh, will be interesting in this system is that uh, if you excite, for example, directly into the 2D, 
So I, as I told you, you will form excitons, which are more difficult to, to dissociate. But then you have a contact with the 3D, and you will be able here to inject an electron here into the 3D. And of course, electron then from the 3D will be uh, uh, scavenged by the electron transporting material on the back. And uh, here, uh, if you do that, of course, you will end up with an electron in the 3D and a hole in the 2D. And in that case, you will form most uh, obviously a charge transfer exciton just at the boundary between the two domains, the 2D and 3D. If you excite now at uh, uh, wavelengths which is longer than 520 nanometers, things will be different because you will be exciting directly into the band gap of the 3D. Electrons will be scavenged directly by the tin oxide on white side. The holes could actually be transported across the 2D. The 2D is actually specifically conducting the holes because the valence band will be uh, aligned with that of the 3D. And uh, then the holes will be transmitted to the HTM. So you see that the 2D layer acts as a whole specific contact and actually will hinder the back transfer because the electrons, of course, will be separated from the hole quite well. So this can be evident, of course, again, by transient absorption spectroscopy. Here we recognize our well-known now uh, uh, differential uh, spectra due to this uh, CTE. And if you fit now this, it, co it will correspond quite well to the second derivative, show showing that again we have something which derives from a change in the permanent dipole, and this is a sign, of course, to the charge transfer exciton. Quite interestingly, we see that this signal now is the most important for butyl ammonium uh, system and the benzyl ammonium system. But when now you, we use uh, cations which are larger, like uh, this uh, uh, PEA that we have seen before, and this fluorinated here cation, we have the distance separating now the 2D layer from the 3D, which increases. And it means that, of course, now our charge transfer exciton becomes very weak because the distance between both is quite important. So in, in that case, the binding energy becomes quite weak. And in that case, the field which is associated with them now tends to decrease. And we see that now these uh, uh, signals, uh, electroabsorption signals are still present, but rather weak. And here, if we measure now the uh, time constant for the move from uh, the 2D to the 3D upon the excitation of uh, the 2D layer. So here we excite the 390 nanometers directly into the 2D layer. We see that uh, now the transfer of uh, holes, so that means disappearance of charge transfer excitons and the transfer of uh, electron now to the 3D layer now takes typically only a few uh, femtosecond or picosecond. After 1.5 picosecond, you see that all the charge transfer excitons are gone. There is nothing left, okay? This means that the electrons now have been injected into the 3D and became free uh, because now this uh, uh, charge transfer exciton get, got dissociated. So uh, charge transfer exciton dissociate to yield free carriers in less than one picosecond, which is remarkable. And this, of course, will uh, make uh, uh, this system quite understandable. And right now, these systems are seen as the solution to protect the uh, perovskite from uh, humidity in particular. And uh, this uh, now mixed uh, dimensionality systems have uh, been uh, shown to, to have both a very large efficiency and a very good stability. And these are now these systems which are seen for applications. Okay, so this is typically what I already uh, um, explained. So that means here you have the disappearance of the excitons and the appearance of the free carriers in the 3D layer. 
So if we would like to summarize a little bit what we have seen so far, so we have seen that uh, upon irradiation, uh, the charge transfer exciton can be seen everywhere. So they are quite ubiquitous now in all systems we, where you have uh, now uh, uh, domains, so different domains due, for example, to a mixed composition or mixed dimensionality. You could also have uh, domains in case uh, where you grow, for example, multigrain morphology. For example, if you try to evaporate these perovskite, usually you will end up with a multigrain morphology rather than uh, something which is homogeneous. And of course, at each grain uh, boundary, you will be able to form charge transfer exciton again. So these uh, charge transfer excitons are evidenced by this uh, photo-induced electroabsorption signal that we can follow just by using transient absorption spectroscopy. Uh, of course, uh, we have to follow this with a, a very good time resolution. And we have seen, for example, that uh, these uh, charge transfer excitons can mediate hole transfer, for example, in uh, uh, system which have a mixed allied composition and the holes will move from bromide-rich to iodide-rich domains with uh, a, a vectorial transport, which will, of course, make you now the charge separation quite efficient in such system. At the end, we have seen that, uh, for example, uh, upon the irradiation of 2D perovskites uh, that we use to coat a 3D uh, perovskite uh, system, we could have here again some interfacial electron injection into the 3D, which is mediated by a charge transfer exciton. And this is extremely efficient and extremely fast since it, can, it uh, occurs in less than one picosecond. So, okay, so I think I used already quite a lot of your time. So I think it's time for, for me to acknowledge the people who actually did all this work. So these are now the people who did the work. And um, uh, I have to underline here the name of Marine Boudubon, who was, of course, uh, central to all this work. She, she made all the theory about that. She made the experiments and she made everything look clear while at the beginning we were seeing only artifacts. So Marine uh, got her PhD uh, now uh, one year ago or two, almost two years ago. So she was fortunate to finish before the COVID. And, uh, <sighs> sorry again. And uh, uh, Arun uh, Paraikatil was also uh, one of the first to, to start with this. Andres was quite uh, important also in the studies. Etienne was the, the guy uh, and, uh, behind the uh, fluorescent subconversion measurements. And uh, Brenner, who joined our group uh, a little bit uh, later, actually was, of course, the specialist of the synthesis of small particles. And, uh, and here we have also to acknowledge, of course, the, the, uh, all the uh, institutions who have financed uh, our research. And uh, I think I can uh, thank you for your kind attention and hoping that uh, I was not too long uh, uh, with uh, a talk in English. So I'm sorry I was not able to give it in Portuguese. So I hope I was clear enough. So. Okay. So thank you so much, Jacques, for your talk. It was quite nice to to see these all these review that you perform here. It was very nice. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You, uh, there is a lot of comments of uh, students uh, acknowledge for your talk, uh, saying that uh, what was really interesting, and uh, you have a lot of questions to. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> so you'd like to to make the questions, Brenner, uh, following the the comments? Yeah, I think uh, people from the conference, you you send us the conference the the question and then. It you appear on our screen. All of this, yeah. Okay. So it's like uh, Leticia Magalhães. Uh, so she asked. It seems that uh, tin dioxide is a better electron transport layer than 
uh, TiO2. Even though there is a larger overpotential for the former, could you explain why uh, tin dioxide is better for perovskite solar cells? There, there is not uh, much of a difference between the two materials. Actually, um, for example, we have two professors here doing applications, like Professor Michael Gretzel, who is a, a very strong supporter of titanium dioxide, and mm -hmm. he thinks that this is the best material, while uh, Anders Hagfeld, who just left our institute recently, is a supporter mm -hmm. of tin oxide. Apparently, tin oxide is a bit easier to deposit in the form of a, a, a layer, a planar layer, because anyway, you are going to use also tin oxide for the uh, conductive glass that you use as a, a, a collector electrode. So on the practical point of view, tin oxide is simpler to, to apply. So a planar layer of tin oxide is simpler to apply than, uh, uh, for example, this mesoscopic TiO2. So this is uh -huh. the reason tin oxide is preferred for these uh, planar layers. TiO2 is a bit more difficult, just practically, it's a little bit more difficult to deposit in the form of a, of a thin layer. Ah, okay. All right. Thank you. And uh, of so, course, you, yeah. Ah, okay. So Leticia Batista uh, asked it, uh, what makes a bromine perovskite to be more stable than those of iodine? Well, so it's a, a complex matter. Actually, I'm not sure I will be able to answer this question easily. So you have seen that bromide, bromine, for example, or bromide is used to stabilize the formabidinium type of uh, systems. In the case of iodine, in this case, uh, these uh, systems are not stable enough. This is just the structure. So actually, this uh, derives from the so-called acceptance uh, size. So that means uh, you can have a 3D structure of uh, this uh, perovskite, uh, provided that the distance between the octahedra is not so large. And of course, the size of the octahedra will depend on uh, these uh, anions. So bromide, brom, bromide will be smaller than iodide. So the octahedra will be a little bit smaller in the case of bromide. And in that case, you will be able to accommodate now these uh, organic uh, ions between the octahedra layer more easily. So this is something that you have to take into account. There is also a thermodynamic uh, parameter that you have also to consider, and this is uh, a little bit more complicated. And uh, all this is uh, has been published, and uh, uh, but uh, of course the, the the main problem with the perovskites is the actually the the wealth of papers. So that means when you are looking for something, usually you find uh, dozens of, uh, of papers, and you have to read quite a lot in order to understand a little bit. So uh, bromide is simply a little bit smaller than iodide, and just the structure is different. Okay. okay. So. Uh... Tiago Cassiano, he asked, uh, Professor, thank you for such an enlightening talk. So uh, there is a limitation regarding the synthesis process for these compounds. How do you see the future perovskites? So the limitation, so as I told you for with my last example, the problem is to make stable perovskite system, which could be applied for photovoltaic applications. And uh, this goes through uh, the coating of 3D uh, materials by 2D layers. So the, the synthesis of the uh, 2D layers on top of the 3D is, of course, a little bit more demanding than just the synthesis of the 3D compound that I described before. So uh, this needs to, this can still be done, of course, by solution processing, but it needs, of course, to have now the 3D layers and then to deposit the, the 2D without destroying the previous layer. So it, it goes through the use of different uh, uh, mixture of solvents and anti-solvents to avoid that you dissolve actually the, the, th the 3D layer. This is actually one uh, 
difficulty, but uh, apparently people, uh, we are not a specialist uh, on this, uh, especially not in my group. So, but uh, it seems that the problem has been uh, solved quite well. And uh, now people are able to, to produce really uh, systems which are extremely stable. So there is one group in our institute and uh, led by Professor Naziruddin in particular, where they have shown that actually they can keep these uh, 2D coated 3D perovskites for months in the air. So uh, without uh, noticeable uh, distraction. So, so I think this is a remarkable result. And indeed, this is uh, quite uh, encouraging for future of perovskites and application of perovskites in, in solar cells. The other possibility is, of course, to, to associate this perovskite with uh, another material like silicon or CIGS, for example. And uh, uh, in these cases, you have tandem cells and where the silicon protects also uh, in a monolithic construction the perovskite. In, and in these cases, you get very stable system and extremely efficient. So I think the future, to my point of view, is more in the direction of these tandem cells, to, to my point of view. So either tandem of perovskite with CIGS, which will absorb more in the near infrared, and uh, and uh, silicon. So both are quite good now, silicon especially. Thank you. Great. So uh, Andres Davi Pado Perdomo asked it. Could we study the photo-induced degradation of perovskite transient absorption measurements by taking spectra in different intervals of time? Yeah, sure. Of course, you could do that. Of course, transient absorption means here you have a lot of time to do that because even if the degradation is fast, to my point of view, it, it still takes minutes or seconds. So you have enough time to do spectra with a, a conventional spectrophotometer. Uh, a better way to actually follow the degradation of perovskite is actually to measure the fluorescence because you will start with the fluorescence of the perovskite so, and for fluorescence it is very easy to, to measure and online and uh, of course as soon as you have a degradation you will move to uh, uh, actually lead iodide so with, which uh, fluorescence is shifted considerably to the blue. So by just following the fluorescence, it will be quite easy to follow the uh, the kinetics of the degradation. Okay, nice. Uh, so Andre Fonseca asked, uh, how can you measure the exciton by the energy in bulk perovskites? So this is for you, Brenner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, of course, yeah. so for bulk exciton, the, bi the binding energy can be derived from the absorption spectrum and fluorescence spectra. And uh, if you just uh, look at the shift between the absorption and fluorescence spectra, this will be possible. Actually, people have done more cleverly also temperature dependence measurements where you, you measure actually the activation energy which is required to dissociate uh, those excitons. And this is uh, actually probably the, the most precise way to measure the binding energy in bulk perovskites. And this explains also that at the beginning, this uh, exciton binding energy was not very well defined. You could find, uh, for example, uh, uh, publication reporting only 10 uh, milli electron volts and other reporting 200 milli electron volts. And this was, of course, quite... Uh, uh, puzzling at the beginning, but I think the last measurements which were done by temperature dependence measurements showed that typically for iodide you have about 20 milli electron volts binding energy for the Vanier exciton, which is very low, and for bromide, of course, it is higher, it goes to 60, 70, 80, maybe 100 milli electron volts. Yeah, okay, thank you. Those full question, <laughs> full answer. So Rubens Moraes asked, uh, Professor, you should you show it and increasing the number of papers on the subject. Do you know if these studies impact the energy industry 
as we know of the difficulties in replacing common energy matrix. So, yeah. <laughs> so this is embarrassing, of course, because if I say no, <laughs> it would mean <laughs> that the 10,000 papers have no impact on science and application. <laughs> but uh, uh, actually, there are uh, several companies who are now uh, on the track. Uh, PV, uh, uh, Oxford PV is one. This is a, a, a spin-off of uh, Oxford University and the, the group of Henry Snace. And they are extremely good in uh, making these uh, tandem silicon uh, uh, perovskite cells. And I've seen already some panels. And uh, I don't think they are on the market yet, but uh, they are very close to commercialize this type of technology. There are companies here in, in, uh, in Sion and in Switzerland too doing the same. And I think uh, when uh, the stability problem will be solved for, uh, for good, I think it will definitely be uh, something interesting. So far, the problem is the stability. So, uh, of course, if you, you, you need to solve the problem and have something that you can put on your roof without seeing your perovskite uh, uh, being dissolved the first time it rains. Yeah. Of course, you can always encapsulate and things like that, but this will make this technology quite uh, expensive. And uh, of course, the driving force to move from silicon to this perovskite is the fact that it is cheaper. Of course, solution processing is a huge advantage in terms of cost of production of a large panel, especially. And uh, if you have to encapsulate and use the same type of technology that you use for silicon, actually you lose this advantage. So uh, now this um, stability problem has to be solved uh, before it can completely be um, well, used in commercial systems. So okay. this is the difficulty and I hope this will be solved quite soon. We, we have seen, of course, a lot of progresses in the last two years, wouldn't we? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. So, Thiago Cassiano asked, uh, what kind of modules are you using to simulate exciton dynamics in your group? To simulate? So, we don't do any simulation? <laughs> yeah. Or, Maybe or actually, uh, <laughs> this is not... This is not absolutely true because recently, of course, there they were two papers uh, that uh, Andres uh, Bogos Caminal has uh, authored where he has made some models. These are complex models, so uh, of course you can refer to these two last papers. Um, one was for charge separation in uh, 3D systems, while the other was in 2D systems. And the models have uh, are quite complicated because the exciton dynamics involve also also some polaronics uh, type of interaction. So that means you have also to take into account the formation of polarons, and uh, also if you have hot excitons, you have uh, then the cooling of the exciton formation of hot polarons, of cold polarons and carriers. So the the model actually has to take into account these three different species. And um, uh, well, then you can build up a model which was made uh, or built mainly from uh, time-resolved terahertz uh, spectroscopy measurements. Mm -hmm. One way actually to distinguish a bulk exciton from uh, free carriers is to use uh, conductivity measurements. And these uh, conductivity measurements can be made at the femtosecond timescale using te terahertz uh, spectroscopy, so far infrared spectroscopy. So this is something that I have not discussed at all in my presentation, but this is something, of course, that we use quite a lot. Mm. I'll say, okay, so Carlos Henriquez, Domingos dos Santos, Ask it, uh, Professor, can you explain the difference of using a nanosecond and femtosecond pulse laser in photo bleaching of PL in these quantum dots? So this is technical, but of course, nanosecond yeah. means that you can have a pulse which is uh, produced by a nanosecond laser. 
And usually you can have detectors which are fast enough, and also the electronics, which is fast enough to follow in real time the changes in the um, uh, light intensity. So that means you can follow in real time some changes in intensity. Just because the best uh, amplifiers are gigahertz typically, and so with gigahertz you can follow up to one nanosecond or slightly shorter to even up to one picosecond events, okay? But now if you move to femtosecond, this is not possible anymore. So first of all, you don't have uh, fast enough uh, detectors and also you have no amplifier or no electronics which is fast enough in order to follow in real time some changes uh, uh, that you could measure. So you have to move from uh, something where you have basically a one beam spectrophotometer in nanosecond uh, laser experiments to a so-called pump probe type of experiment where you have actually two pulses and the time between the two pulses is actually controlled simply by the, making the optical path in the laser setup uh, slightly longer for the probe than from, for the pump. So technically it's quite different. So a nanosecond uh, pulse laser system sits on a, a very small table on your desk, probably. It's a one meter <laughs> by one meter. You can have a very nice system with just an oscilloscope while a pump probe type of femtosecond laser costs probably close to $1 million. <laughs> dollars <laughs> and uh, requires, of course, uh, a femtosecond laser, some uh, fancy systems, and an optical table, and so on. So there is a huge, act actually, technical difference between the two techniques. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, Adriano Santos, uh, what is the main challenge in the field in order to develop more efficient solar cells? So, yeah. as you can see, in terms of, uh, of power conversion efficiency, we are all already very close to optimum. So, we are, there is not much room actually to increase the efficiency. What, you, what could be done is, of course, to make a multi-junction system. So, to go beyond the Shockley-Kaiser limit. So, in principle, to go beyond the famous 31% uh, theoretical limit. So to do that, of course, these uh, multi-junctions or the tandem cells uh, would be uh, ideal. So a way to develop more efficient solar cells would be to move to, to those tandem cells. And this is exactly what people have done with those silicon perovskite uh, systems, which can have a very large uh, uh, open circuit voltage, typically 1.5 volts, which is very large. And... Uh, very good efficiencies, so beyond 27%, uh, so which is uh, uh, comparable to the, the very expensive silicon multi-junction cells. And uh, this is probably the direction. You could think about even a, a double heterojunction, so with, for example, a CIGS, a perovskite, and maybe something with a bromide, uh, perovskite bromide, in order to absorb more efficiently in the blue and things uh, like this. So if you do a tri-heterojunction or even a, a quadruple heterojunction, you could, of course, go to higher efficiency. Mm. But this is, of course, technically difficult because you have to match all the photocurrents and so on. So this is not so easy to be done. But this is probably one way to go is to go for multi-junction solar cells. Also, the building of those multi-junction solar cells with silicons in some monolithic uh, architecture will also solve the problem of, uh, of uh, stability because you have something which is monolithic and the silicon covers the perovskites and protects it. Mm. Okay. I think it, this oh. is the last one, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Thais Adrian, 
She asked, uh, can you comparatively study the different materials as whole transport la layers or electric transport layers for solar cells by transient absorption spectroscopy? Of course, yeah. If you remember one of the very first uh, band alignment scheme that I showed, so which correspond to a publication that we uh, published in 2014, we did that. Actually, we measured the... Uh, the, the time necessary for charge transfer from our perovskite to these different layers. Of course, what we, you can do is also to use, now this is something that I have not discussed, but this electroabsorption to follow now the uh, transport of the carriers in these different layers. One way to do that would be to apply an external electric field. So if you apply an external electric field, you will generate this torque effect in all the different layers and uh, and then when the carriers will move in these layers of course they will affect the electric field usually when the charges uh, separate they will oppose to the electric field which is applied externally and by opposing you will see the stock effect decreasing so by by measuring the time dependence of the stock effect in the systems where you apply an external electric field you will be able to measure the the charge transport across these layers and this is something that we have done also so in this case the technique is slightly different rather than relying on photo induced stark effect we, it, it will be called the electromodulated differential absorption spectroscopy eda but basically the idea is the same except that you apply an electric field externally yeah. Okay, guys. Lab, professor. Sorry, I'm sorry. You have it uh, in your lab, such a system? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Of course. Of course. Yes. Yes. And so uh, far, we have uh, applied it. To... Uh, there is a, uh, another questions. I forget ah. here. There is another one, isn't it? Uh, from. Yeah. I think we have like. Many questions, but I don't know if you'll be one. able to answer everything. So, uh, how external annihilation could impact the stock signal? Very simply, if you don't have exciton anymore, then you don't have stock signal anymore. If you are talking about the charge transfer exciton, so so that means you will see the stock signal disappear when you have exciton annihilation. Mm. So, this is rather simple. Uh, do you have any questions, Brenner? For... Uh, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> How? <laughs> for one, please. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think about bi excitons or hot bi excitons. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think so, I have a, a last question for you, Professor. Uh, how do you see the changes? Um, in research involving the dynamics transfer in perovskite nanocrystals. Um, so, in which level do you think the researchers are today? Uh, are well, so for, for years, you know, uh, this type of research was uh, driven by the techniques. So, since we had a lot of physicists involved in the system, uh, everybody wanted to try their toys on this uh, particular perovskite system. And uh, so that means if somebody invented uh, some technique like turret spectroscopy, they wanted to use it and to try. Uh, well, electron, uh, well, electroabsorption is no different. So it's, uh, for us, it was the same, basically. So we applied first the techniques to organic solar cells, and then we thought, well, why don't we do the same with perovskites? Okay, so this is now a trend that um, lasted for quite uh, a few years. Now things are a little bit different because there are not so many questions which are left, but since still there are some questions that... Uh, are quite important, especially for uh, quantum confined uh, uh, perovskite systems where the, the physics is not very well known. And the uh, involvement of the polarons and things like that is also quite important. So in that case, people are trying to find the best techniques in order to do that. Uh, 
So there are new techniques which were designed specifically to, to uh, address uh, this type of new problem, like a pump push probe spectroscopy that I have not discussed today, but uh, which is something that we would like to, to, to be more and more involved in, uh, which was uh, first uh, demonstrated by the group of friends in, in Cambridge University. And uh, this seems to be extremely interesting. So the trend for this uh, fast, ultra fast uh, uh, measurements goes to uh, some techniques which are a little bit more complex, but which can provide in the same time uh, information on the time, but also on the energy. Now, the other trend, which is extremely important, specifically for these solar cells, which contain different domain, is ultrafast microscopy. So time-resolved microscopy. So where people actually combine uh, an ultrafast laser system transient absorption with microscopy, where you can actually uh, see now the different domains and you can really do spatial temporal measurements where you can see the carrot jumping directly with microscopy from one domain to the other. This is fascinating to me and uh, I, I would love to do that, of course. Yeah, for sure. Um, so thank you so much for this talk. Uh, I think everybody enjoyed a lot it. So as you might know, uh, I do not, uh, je ne parle pas bien français. Donc, je voudrais vous remercier pour cette euh, intéressante conférence. Wow. Euh, dire que nous sommes très heureux de votre présence euh, avec nous aujourd'hui. Encore, c'est on, online, mais c'était très important pour nous. Merci, Merci beaucoup. beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. So thanks a lot. I'm sorry I cannot uh, answer in Portuguese. So I'm really confused. I should have prepared something <laughs> at least yeah. to, to okay. say goodbye. But uh, but uh, well, I wish, of course, the rest of the conference a lot of success. So I, I've seen that you have a very busy schedule, a very interesting lecture. So I will try to follow some of them. Uh, because, uh, well, these are quite interesting for me too. So thanks again for your in kind invitation. And uh, of course, we would like to continue some collaboration with Brenner. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what he's doing <laughs> is, of course, extremely in interesting and important for us. Okay. okay. And uh, of course, with you through Brenner, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, yeah, Jacques. Oh, thank goodbye you so to much. everybody and thanks to you. Okay. Bye bye. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Então, pessoal, é, agradeço ao Brenner, aos professores, à comissão organizadora do evento. É, gostaria de agradecer a todos vocês pela presença em nossa segunda atividade. Gostaria de lembrar que a gente retorna hoje às 13 horas para a gente poder dar início à primeira parte dos minicursos. Lembrando, pessoal, que o link está no chat né, do formulário de presença. Fiquem atentos, a gente vai deixar por mais uns 10 minutos. Fiquem atentos para poder preencher esse link para garantir o, o certificado de vocês. Então, desejo a todos um bom intervalo e até breve.